Okay, I believe we are live. Thank you so much for joining us. Please share this broadcast with your friends and networks now. We're so excited that you're joining us on the Welcome to We Show. My name is Rick Ulfick, and I'm founder of We the World and the We Campaign at we.net. We the World is a global coalition building organization with 11 campaigns for change, and you can take action with us by going to we.net. On the Welcome to We Show, we have three goals to inspire, inform, and involve you in creating a world that works for all. That's three eyes that make a we so we can go from a me society to a we society. And on this show, we ask the all important question, what can we do together that we can't do on our own to create a more peaceful, sustainable planet and civilization? On today's show, we will be illuminating the Earth Charter with climate stories. And to tell us more about that and to set the stage, let's bring in my co-host, Sue Blythe. Sue Blythe coordinates We the World's Campaign for the Environment, and she is the founder of the Climate Collaboratory, a pilot project of We the World and the University of Florida Extension. Welcome to the broadcast, Sue Blythe. Thank you so much, Rick Ulfick. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, share with you some of the uh, activities that we've been doing in the Climate Collaboratory. Um, some of you remember that this uh, project was set up uh, in 2019 as a, uh, a pilot project with We the World and University of Florida Extension uh, with the Sustainable Floridians program. And starting in uh, October of last year, we have had a what we call the Florida Climate Conversation to Action Program. And basically we've been meeting once a month talking about themes of sustainable living and uh, finding out what people are doing to uh, create a more sustainable, just, and peaceful future. And so what we have tonight is a series, it's actually our celebration for the graduation of this program, and we have a lot of people with wonderful stories to tell. And uh, so I'm going to be um, introducing uh, one of our young people who's involved in a group that we call Tomorrow's Dreamers. And uh, Brianna is here, with, uh, Brianna Skildum, and she is uh, a young professional who has uh, been helping us with this, uh, the Earth Flash game show. And uh, Brianna, uh, it's time to play the Earth Flash Earth Charter Treasure Hunt. And I'd like you to kind of explain what that is and how we're going to do that with these wonderful people who have come from the Climate Collaboratory. Sure, thank you, Sue. Um, so our Earth Charter Treasure Hunt is kind of um, a loosely structured treasure hunt that we have going on um, that we're starting now and with the um, sort of publication of our first edition of the Prince Your Neck Gazette. Um, that is kind of a search that we're doing for people within communities that illuminate the four pillars of the Earth Charter. Those four pillars are respect and care for the community of life, ecological integrity, social and economic justice, and democracy, nonviolence, and peace. And with the treasure hunt, we are looking for four individuals for each of those categories. So 16 people total who exemplify those characteristics that help bring those things into reality, that help make those pillars real, um, that help us see those things in our day-to-day -day life. And so with this 
climate to conversation action or um, yeah, climate conversation to action program that we're doing. And with the conversation and storytelling that we're doing today, um, we are kind of doing like a little introduction to that. And we're kind of giving ourselves a head start to fill in those categories um, with some of these stories that we're looking for. And so today we have with us, we have uh, Angelique, also known as Born in the Cloud of Smoke. We have Jenison Kipp. We have Joanne Schwandes, Esther Frick, Kimberly Gila, Jay Rosenbeck, Sherry Stark, Helen Warren, Jim Graywolf for Truzy, Ensign Cowell, Sue Blythe, and myself. And then we have some other people who have stories to tell that aren't with us today, but will be with us in the future. Great. So would you like to, uh, I guess I can start introducing our dear friend, uh, born in a cloud of smoke, who has an introduction for us. That darn mute button. <laughs> I mean in the way Maganuk. That means uh, greetings, my relatives. I'm so glad to be here uh, to be celebrating. I heard there was going to be a party celebration. I'm in. And then I heard there was going to be a game. I'm in. When you get to be this old, you don't want to do anything unless it's fun. So I'm glad we're going to have some fun tonight. And we get to hear stories. So... I was thinking about those things that uh, my granddaughter there, Rihanna, what she had to say. I, I was thinking about those four pillars. So I'm going to be listening and I want you to be listening too. So that at the end of the storytelling, you'll kind of be thinking, where does that story fit in those four pillars? Where does that story fit in the Earth Charter? Where does that story fit in making a world that works for everyone in the change from the I to the we? It's all interconnected. So I'm so glad to hear to be here. And I'm going to be listening. And I want you to be listening. Because after we're done with the game, I've got another little challenge for you. So my story is I got to be with these people in and out, in and out, but I got to be with these people going through this climate collaboratory and to try to do so. And the things I heard, the actions they were taking, they're gonna make it happen. They're gonna change the world. So I think we should hear all their stories. Oh, Chimi Gwetchen, thank you for listening, Sue. And thank you so much. Uh, born in a cloud of smoke, and we do love to have you with us. And so <clears throat> I would like to introduce someone that we all love very much, and it's Jenison Kipp, who is the state coordinator of the um, Sustainable Floridians program that our climate collaboratory is based on. So as we went through these eight months, we were actually doing uh, the base of our conversation to action program was the uh, Sustainable Floridians program, which has been growing and developing for 10 years and has won many awards and is on its way to a new level that we'll talk about later. But I'd like to introduce my dear friend, Jenison Kipp, who is busy with her statewide uh, program tonight. And so she couldn't be with us, but she did want to say something about uh, what's going on here. So this is Jenison Kipp. I want to thank you for inviting me to the conversation tonight. Um, Sue, it's been wonderful collaborating with you. My climate story for 
this evening um, and leading up to tonight is that when I learned about Sue, when I met Sue years ago, and I learned what she had been building for so many years, um, you know, creating this storytelling adventure for how we as a community get to a place where we've acted on climate change and we've, you know, tackled the climate crisis in a way that's meaningful and matches the scale of the challenge. When I learned that, I felt inspired to branch out beyond my academic world and build a real bridge and partnership with Sue as a community collaborator and her entire network of climate champions who are working on the climate collaboratory as well. Um, so, so when I met Sue and learned about what she was doing, I felt inspired. And ultimately, after years of conversations about how to make it happen, um, we were just thrilled to be able to launch the Climate Collaboratory as a pilot project of the Sustainable Floridians program and We the World uh, back in the fall. And so COVID, of course, threw a wrench into things and we had to adapt as we, as we learned together and moved forward, but it's just been a really exciting adventure and continues to inspire me with all of the different climate collaborators who've come into the conversations that we've held thus far um, and are so clearly committed to doing this work for the long haul. Um, you know, they're committed to bringing their personal stories, just like Sue has done. They're committed to turning that into something tangible for not just our communities here in Gainesville and Alachua County and throughout Florida, but beyond like truly connecting what we do at a grassroots to the global level and to the global sustainable development goals. So that's where my climate story begins. Oh. And that's my phone number. <laughs> I was listening in. So we uh, want to. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> ah, okay. So let me uh, find my place back again. We have. Um, Rick, we're going to have a lot of people coming on. And uh, so maybe we want to go gallery view for this. I think that. Um, it's it's covered as we speak. OK, thank you. Um, we're going so, back and forth between those views. Oh, OK. Depending on who's I'm, speaking. I'm seeing people that are not speaking, so it's OK. All right, so that was Jenison, and uh, one of our regulars in our climate conversation was my dear friend, Joanne Schwandis. And uh, Joanne, why don't you come on and, and uh, tell us about uh, what inspires you and, and what's your climate story? Hello, I'm Joanne Schwandis, and I, as Sue said, is, I'm a longtime friend. And I have lived far away from Sue for many years now. But when I learned about her efforts to bring people together, to take conversations to action, I felt a desire to engage and decided to join the conversation, knowing that it would take me beyond just sitting around and talking and talking about important things, but to figuring out a way where I could fit into the picture. And um, so when the collaboratory started inviting people to participate, I did join the conversation and got inspired, like Jenison said, um, to find out more about how climate change was impacting individuals that I have known 
and I reconnected, thanks to the internet, with an old friend from the Solomon Islands. And I looked into how climate change was affecting the lives of the people there. And it has reconnected me with a daughter of his who was named after me, who is now 18 years old and doing amazing things in her own right there. So the, it took, it's taking the conversation into action, but it's also allowing me to engage at a new different, a new level and engaging with the people in this group, in this conversation continually inspires me week after week after week, Tuesday after Tuesday after Tuesday, connecting with people, cheering them on and feeling encouraged by them as well. Thank you for asking me to say something. Well, thank you, Joanne, and you've added so much to our conversation. I really appreciate it. So our next climate collaborator is Esther Fick, uh, and she's going to tell us about uh, what about her climate story. Yes. So my name is Esther Fick, and I live in Dauphin, Manitoba, Canada, which is just above North Dakota. Um, three years ago, I learned about the devastating effects of climate change. I had known something about it, but three years ago, it really hit and it became eco anxiety, which manifested itself as the image of a rat eating, eating, eating at my stomach area, but never consuming me. Sometimes I wish that it would consume me so that the pain would be over. What it did give me was a very deep understanding of why people with generalized anxiety disorder are become heroin addicts or take their own life. Eventually, I sold my beautiful farm and house and moved to Dauphin, where I was born. And very soon thereafter, I, I joined a Citizens Climate Lobby, and I put my anxiety energy into that. So last year, I trained as a climate ambassador for En-ROADS, and this is a simulator, climate simulator, that was developed at MIT Sloan by 23 Nobel laureates and 3,500 plus scientists, climatologists, um, financiers, economists, social activists. It's a simulator that shows us how to get below not only 2 degrees Celsius, but 1.5 degrees Celsius. And that's why I became an ambassador. So. I need to share my screen and I will show you a little bit of how it works. Can you all see that? Okay, good. Um, I am going to see if I can get that over here. Okay, good. So uh, you see that this is 3.6 if we do nothing by 2100. And I need to tell you that this has been lowered from 4.1 about six to eight months ago because of the efforts of renewables and wind and solar energy, that kind of thing. So this is huge. This is 0.5 degrees Celsius, a huge difference. So um, if we look at the uh, levers here that I will manipulate, we can talk about what is most effective. So if I go down here to carbon pricing, I need to put that down. Uh, boy, it won't let me do that. Um, I need to get my get this out of the way here. Um, all right, well, I'll just do it like this. So let's go to carbon pricing. And we can see that it's down to 2.7. Now this is to $250 a ton. If you click on any of these three dots, you get an expanded detail of what this means. And you can do that whenever you like. Um, the next thing we can look at is reducing methane and other emissions. That gets us down to 2.3. Then if we go to carbon renewal um, I wish I could get that 
out of there, but I can't. Um, if we can go to technological, if we can get this, then that brings us down to 1.7. And then if we go to transport and electrification and electrify everything, we're now at 1.6. Then if we go to buildings electrification and electrify buildings, we get down to 1.5. And then if we go to transport energy efficiency, that gets us to 1.4. If we go to stop deforestation, we're at 1.3. And here's the trillion trees. That'll take us to 1.2. And this is very user friendly, I find. And I would encourage you to go and I'll put the website into the chat unless somebody else has done that. And, I'll, and uh, it's free. Anybody can use it. And we ambassadors are available for workshops. So that was a really quick workshop <laughs> that I just did. Esther, that's so wonderful to know that it's it's not only possible, but we can do this uh, right. to get down to the uh, below that 1.5 that the uh, Paris Climate Accord called for. And uh, what I impresses me is, you know, you started with the um, bringing the, the carbon tax brings it down so significantly. And one organization known as Citizens Climate Lobby is really focused on that. And so I think a large part of what we're doing in the Climate Collaboratory is helping people to find the thing that they're most passionate about and knowing what organizations are already working on that so that we don't have to feel like I have to start this all by myself. I can join an organization and work with other people who are just as passionate. And, and I'm just, I, yeah, I go need, ahead. I need to say that it's carbon fee and dividend. And, and explain what that money means. money back. Everybody <laughs> in Canada gets money back. Yes. And 10% goes to MUSH, which is municipalities, universities, schools, and hospitals. Beautiful. Well, oh, I, have a, I have a question for you. Esther, have you uh, sent that whole platform that you showed us to uh, members of Congress in the United States and uh, and government, of course, in in Canada? I think that would be very instructive for people who could could know exactly what they can vote on to have that, those kinds of effects that you're talking about. Absolutely, CCL. <laughs> Citizens Climate Lobby is a global organization, which was began begun in the United States by a fellow named Marshall Saunders. And this was back in the, the early 2000s. So CCL US is very um, active and really um, lobbying Congress for this. And CCL Canada, um, our government knows this really, really well because we have this laser focus on carbon fee and dividend and we are experts i that's what our, our leader says kathy orlando at lobbying our politicians beautiful well thank you for the wonderful work and boy am i glad you found a way to relieve that eco anxiety <laughs> thank you <Bob. laughs> oh, wonderful well let's listen to uh kimberly gila who is um with a group that I know and love. And in fact, uh, Elders Climate Action is one of the co-sponsors of the um, uh, Climate Collaboratory. And our, our meetings that we do on Tuesday are with the Florida chapter of the Florida Climate, or the Elders Climate Action. And so Kimberly, can you uh, tell us about your climate story? And, and also Kimberly, if you're able to turn your video on, that would be great. If not, on our video, can you see it now? Not yet. Yes. How about now? Can you? Okay. I'm Kimberly Gila. I'm from the Northern California chapter of Elders Climate Action. And um, I first heard about Sue Bright when I took the climate change course at Vermont Baha'i Institute in 2017. And um, I heard about how the wonderful things she's doing in Florida. Elders Climate Chapter in the University of Florida. And I'm gonna write about um, 
I'm going to talk about Southwest Airlines. I travel frequently from San Francisco to Las Vegas, and I don't want to be a hypocrite. So, so I took the initiative of writing to Southwest Airlines. What are they doing about climate change? You know, they got the fumes from their jet engines. Anyway, lo and behold, I, I received a letter from the CEO of Southwest Airlines, and, and I was amazed that they are taking, um, they are making changes into renewable resources for their jet engines, and they are the leaders of the airline industry of making this happen. And moving forward, they are, they will, for their future fleet of airlines, they will make it more sustainable as building their new planes in the future. And I thought that was wonderful when I heard from the CEO of Southwest Airlines. This is my story. Okay. And thank I, you. Thank for you. Inviting me yeah. too. Yes, thank you, Kimberly. And I'd like to uh, just uh, say that your story doesn't stop there. That I know that you have done a lot more reaching out. Could you tell us some of the others that you have uh, talked with about these issues? I also wrote to United Airlines. They're doing the same thing as uh, Southwest Airlines, Greyhound Bus, um, Amtrak Train, and that other, yeah, Flix bus. So that's wonderful. Public transportation is the way to go, especially when they change their policies to sustainability and to change their fuel injection systems for the engine. Indeed. So thank you for taking good care of our transportation sector. And uh, I know that Esther can use that on her, uh, on her, what would we call that? The uh, master board for the En-ROADS uh, climate simulator. And uh, so thank you, Kimberly. You're welcome, thank you. Yeah, and next I'd like to invite uh, Jay Rosenbeck to uh, tell us his climate story. I know, Jay, that you've been um, working on a solar array in uh, Gainesville, Florida area um, where we live. And so maybe you could tell us what you've learned in, in that. Sure. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Rick. My climate story for tonight begins in 2018 when the Gainesville City Commission signed a bill promising to convert to 100% renewable energy by 2045. I spoke during their negotiations and I applauded on the day of their announcement. And now if we skip ahead three years to 2021, after a slow start, the city of Gainesville started to act on that law. They signed a so-called power purchase agreement with a firm that promised to build a utility-sized solar array on a few hundred acres of land south of a small rural town in Alachua County. And again, I wrote a letter of support. The contractor, once the power purchase agreement was signed, began to talk to the white and black neighbors uh, that might be affected in some way by this solar array. And boy, did they get an earful. Folks next to that solar array were concerned about pollution, about falling property values, about racism, about threats to a way of life and to the wildlife they shared the earth with. And those same neighbors have now formed a powerful resistance to this solar array. Now, final decision has not been reached, but the animus that this project has created is dividing rural and urban, black and white, and the environmental community. So I had to ask myself, why did I support this project that is so strongly resisted by the people most affected. 
And my reason was because I believe and believed that supporting clean renewable energy is a moral imperative. And that's, that support put me on the side of the angels. Well, it turns out that the angels do not side with solar and wind. They side with the principles of environmental justice. First, that all people need to be part of planning from the outset of a conversion to renewables. And second, that those most affected by the results need special benefits. And these principles were neglected in the planning of this previous projects in Alachua County. And this is an environmental lesson that I will never ever forget. Being educated, thoughtful, dedicated, righteous, and wrong is a powerful teacher. And that's my story. Thank you, Jay. My goodness, what a what a learning experience, huh? Yes. And and uh, tapping into the climate justice issues, as you say, reminds us that we really need to include everyone at every step of these major decisions that have to be made. From so the very beginning. From the beginning. If we don't get this right, Sue, solar may well be dead in Alachua County, and we are not unique in our uh, discovering that there's resistance to what seems to all of us environmentalists like just a perfectly sane and even moral movement. Right. So the idea that um, climate change is affecting the uh, black and brown communities, people of color, indigenous people, much more than those of us who live in, uh, in relative luxury. And um, so being able to include all people in, in that conversation is very important. I do notice that our, our group tonight is all white. Isn't that interesting? And uh, we do have some friends who uh, have been involved in our climate storytelling uh, that are um, of, of different uh, cultural groups. And we are um, certainly wanting to partner in better ways, uh, especially with a, an organization called the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice committee and uh, we do have a lot of friends in that uh, organization but we have not uh, yet uh, we don't have anyone from there tonight and that makes me a little sad and knowing that we need to work harder on that we can change that and, and, I, and I must say that we also have um, two indigenous people three indigenous people with us tonight and so uh, Brianna her grandmother, Shannon, and our friend, Jim Graywolf Petruzzi, that we'll be talking with soon. Thank you, Jay. And uh, so now I'd like to go to Sherry Stark, who is um, also with the Elders Climate Action. And uh, she has a wonderful story to tell about how she's been able to reach out into the community. Thank you, Sue. My name is Sherry Stark and I'm living in West Hollywood, California. And as she said, I'm part of the Elders Climate Action Group, the Southern California chapter. I've been involved or interested in climate crisis for as long as I can remember. I compost my kitchen scraps, I gave up beef. We have an electric car that we drive around town and it's always the most important issue to me in deciding who to vote for. But living through this last administration's assault on all the progress we made left me with a new level of dread. 
I started to seriously wonder for the first time whether our species was going to make it. I was trained as a journalist, so I decided to try to write some stories and videos to try to call more attention to the subject. And I started with the uh, Elders Climate Group because they're a, a proactive group. And I also love the angle that even though we're technology challenged, we're organizing on the internet and using the Zoom and such to try to make a difference. I made a number of videos that I posted on their YouTube page. And even though uh, they haven't gone viral yet, they have been very good in terms of getting interest and morale and people to come to our workshops and uh, town hall meetings. I've also been able to get a couple of press releases posted in a magazine called Grand for grandparent, arid, grandparent, grandparent aged readers. What I found is that when I pitched them story ideas, they wanted to focus on people rather than on the projects per se. They didn't want to be seen as partisan and they felt that human interest stories would be of more general interest. The first one I did was about my elders group reaching out to potential voters, including environmentalists who they were able to determine hadn't voted in recent elections educating them on how to get mail-in ballots and about early voting procedures. But the focus of the story was mostly on how the members were passionate about giving back to society. The second one was about a group called Grandmothers for a Green New Deal, a group of elder women who made a video about the bill and are holding educational workshops with it from Northern California's ECA chapter actually. The focus again was on them and how they're doing this for their grandkids sake. We need to have more positive personal stories to get this message out, how people all over the world are waking up to this subject. The personal narratives are not only easier, I found, to get on media, but they're also more convincing in changing people's minds and behaviors. And it's not the number of hits or pairs of eyes that the story reaches, it's how it's, they're affected by it or are they moved by it. And sometimes a small, passionate group, uh, a network is way more powerful than a million casual viewers. Uh, we need a multi-pronged approach to get this story out, inclusive, and i um, very excited to try to find new ways to get the story out and help this message. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Sherry. It's just wonderful to see how effective your outreach has been to uh, get into the magazines. And um, it feels to me like the storytelling piece is, is what we really need to develop. And this program that we've been doing for eight months now has just so inspired me to uh, invite people in to tell more of their stories. And it, with you helping to get the word out, you and others, and I think that we can be part of the process of helping to amplify all of these stories and get them out into the world. What's really and exciting is I it like seems, to... uh, pardon me, it's, it, it seems like it's synchronicity. It seems like there's climate story groups springing up all over the internet, all age groups, all parties. So it seems like it's something the society is is yearning for. So it's exciting to be to, to feel that energy. I'm I'm very passionately yes. inspired by you as well, Sue. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. Well, it's really um, exciting to know that every single person alive on the planet today has a climate story to tell, whether they're aware of it yet or not. And so I'm going to uh, talk to one very inspiring climate collaborator, and that will be Helen Warren, who uh, is coming to us with some uh, very uh, She's been in the political world. So, Helen, can you tell us your climate story? Yes, and what a great group to be following. And, and you know, I made notes as each individual was talking about their story. And just to be able to say that, Sherry, you're right on about all these different um, opportunities that are there for people to connect somehow, because that's, that's my story. As uh, Sue mentioned, I've been involved in politics. I was a city commissioner here at the city of Gainesville for two years. But prior to that, my passion had been through the Audubon and birding, but the birding wasn't for listing and counting the birds. It was a, a reason to be outdoors and with other people and sharing the experience of talking about um, the relationship of the trees and migration and the food that's available for the birds. And I just really love um, what I call the big picture is the Gaia theory that the earth is a living thing. And I will say that when I 
realized that that was probably my most coming to Jesus moment or Buddha or whoever it may be, Mother Earth, but that every element of this earth has a special relationship to the other layers. And the more and more we dig into the belly of the earth, uh, we not only find rats, but we find that we bring things up that cause harm to the environment, which hurts everybody. With the limited time that we have here today, um, many of you have talked about one tool or another that is available for us to reach the individuals. And I think that that's really important. As, as an Audubon person, I had gone up to Washington, D.C. several times between 2000 and 2010 to try to get our leadership there to do the big policy changes that we see and that we have known about for more than 30 years you know, prior to the 2000. And it was sad to say that the representatives I spoke to from my state and my representatives had a deaf ear um, or a, they, they were not hearing, they were deaf in, the, in, in speaking too. So when I was able to get back here and work with the city of Gainesville, run for the city of commission, it was connecting me to the idea that we locally can do more. And as a city commissioner, what I found that when people are wanting government to either do all of it, fix all the problems or do nothing, I became aware that more and more what we need to do is embrace the responsibility that each of us has. Reaching out to our politicians and telling them what we need, but also then as citizens to see what it is that we can do. And one of the last acts that I got to do as a city commissioner is just one of the proudest things that I have got to experience. And that was when a friend approached me and asked me if I would lead the city into a proclamation that we are in a climate emergency. And when I was first reading the materials about that, I was like, oh, this is all doomsday and this is uh, going to create chaos and all that. But as I read more and more, I became more aware of the, the, the venue of action that is available when we claim a climate emergency. And as a resident in Florida, the analogy is easy to say, when it's hurricane season, as we are approaching here in May with June just around the corner, when, it, when you hear about a hurricane and when you prepare for hurricane season, you get things in place, you get a plan and you do what you know that you can if the hurricane is going to come to us. And that connection to what we can do about climate change and the climate crisis really, um, you know, when we work in this field, there are times we have highs and we have lows. And it's a natural part of the process. What I love about the lows emotionally when I'm doing this work is that I find something that gives me that new inspiration as Brianna was talking about we need to be inspired to do things. Um, and the four pillars that she talked about, there is something out there for each of us. As I, so the climate crisis, you know, that we are in an emergency status is something that we can share with our friends on a gentle um, message, but with urgency. It's really important to be able to have an element of urgency. And coming involved with Soup Life, now I'll transition to this new part of my coming up out of that low slope is having the connections with Sue and Jenison and this um, We the World and the Earth Charter again. Um, and I've been introduced to a tool that connects Earth Charter type of principles to other principles. And if we are going to get the people of the world involved, it's gotta be through education. And as I show you these materials, imagine if we had these materials being used in our schools, the K-12 curriculum, in the colleges. Every student in a college level of higher education should be having a conversation that says, how is this education preparing me for a future, not just to earn money, not just the economics, but for the planet to be taken care of for the seven generations that we should be thinking about rather than my immediate needs. And Jay, the conversation you had about working with solar energy really emphasizes this principle again, that we need to get the people educated about why 
the solar fields, even though it's GRU, the solar energy that's collected to produce electricity is shared across the state. Every utility provider shares the same electric wires to get power from one part to another to your house. And NAACP did have a workshop this last weekend about climate change and energy. I think it was uh, solar fields. So now quickly, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I've had to keep these programs going so I wouldn't have to log in again. But if I go to this, uh, great, it works. This is part of the eco challenge uh, process. And if uh, I'll send in the link, ecochallenge.org. Up here, you can see the eco challenge store. But what it has are those pillars that we were talking about that allows a conversation in any of these ways, building resilience, healing and renewal, electricity. And just to give an example of what comes in under each of those topics is that it can tell you actions that you can do very easily. And I share these conversations with my neighbors when I'm out walking my dog. I get points for walking my dog. I get points talking about gardening. And so I'm able to build up um, a conversation with individuals about these ways to connect to thinking about what we're going to do in the future. So as you can see this one, invite a friend to calculate their carbon footprint. communicate with my elected officials. And you can choose these items to be a part of your dashboard that you will um, put in to action. This is my dashboard. I've got going for a walk daily. It's kind of lame because I have a dog and it's real easy to do that walk. But it is also part of a daily conversation because I always run into somebody to have a conversation with. You can see I've got a garden. I can share seeds and seedlings with my neighbors. And when I pick something, I can share those items. Planting trees. I did all of this stuff this last weekend. Food waste. I mean, there are just so many things that we can do. And then you can click on this and learn more about how food waste is such an important item. Our trash is so critical to change, that we need to change the way we deal with our trash. And I'm blessed to be in a neighborhood that actually has curbside food waste pickup. I have a five gallon pail that gets picked up every day, or I'm sorry, once a week for food waste. And what we would like to do as part of our challenge is that we have this local challenge, but you can create a, a drawdown challenge anywhere. By signing in, you can go to their website. You can see the list of teams that are out there and see by state what teams are in your area. And you can then connect them or organize a team of your own. And I am a part of the team here, Florida Climate Conversation to Action. We have eight participants. We would love more people to join if you're here in the Gainesville, Alachua area. And then the last point that I'll share with this is imagine if we had, so you can compete and you can see with our numbers down here, we're at 946, but up here, Team 7 Gorillas, there's this whole Eco Raiders that's just blasting away on their points. Imagine if we had our schools each have a team and could just compete with each other or the Girl Scouts. You know, I, I've been in touch with one of the Girl Scout leaders here. and We're still trying to work out a date now that we have our masks available to be removed and go talk with the, the troops. But that's going to be my next step is to reach out to the Girl Scouts and try to get some more competition because it's a conversation and, and we don't need to compete about everything, but it's a way to just have more conversations about what we are doing. 
And the materials, we have this book that is available, Choices for Sustainable Living, that is like a workbook that you can use in going through um, the activities that you do. And it's an excellent tool that we could take it easily to the school board. And tr what we're trying to do is find the school board's awareness that this topic can be incorporated into every curriculum. There's room for science, math, and all of those things can be written about. You can you know, incorporate your grammar and communication skills at every level. So like what uh, Brianna was saying about the four pillars of the Earth Charter, you know, imagine having the kids walk home from school and have them identify what kind of things in their environment can they help be a solution to? Because that's what we need. Problems have solutions and you get rid of the rat when you're involved with defeating the problem. So thank you for this opportunity. I know I went a little bit long, but I could go longer. Your, your enthusiasm is, is it, it contagious and we appreciate it so much. And uh, thank you for getting that declaration of uh, climate emergency. That was part of the inspiration for this climate collaboratory was to actually get this climate conversation started to help everybody in our commu local community to uh, realize the urgency and find definite easy ways that they can be involved uh, as part of the solution. Okay, thank you, Helen. And uh, I'd like to um, move now to a friend who is working in storytelling in many ways and then um, is especially interested in um, restoring the relationship that we have with the sacred spaces, sacred lands. And Jim Graywolf Petruzzi, uh, could you tell us a little about your climate story? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I was thinking, boy, this, I'm gonna be interested in this. I didn't realize you were talking about me. Um, yeah. Amazing listening to you all. And somebody mentioned the word before, which I can't remember, but it's, the way things are just coming together now. And that's exactly right. So I hear your stories and I hear the pieces that talk to my heart because they're the same things I've been working on. Some of them for years, some of them just recently. And to me, that's the main way forward. I go back a long way. I look back and I see what was going on with nature and the climate when I was younger. And some of this problem was already starting, but we didn't know it. And we believed, believed when, when um, um, government people and business people told us, don't worry, we'll take care of all this. And of course, they never have. They're still saying that. And still, it doesn't happen. And it won't happen. And that, to me, is the important thing right now. We, I'm so glad we're here for we tonight. Thank you. We have to come together. This is about the people. This is not about governments. They will not do it. This is not about the wealthy. They will not do it. Collectively, we can make happen what needs to happen. And that doesn't mean we stop the other things we're doing. Not at all. They're critical. I do some of them as well. Um, I'm a member of the United Western Lenape tribe. We passed the first climate emergency proclamation by an indigenous tribe uh, in the Americas. And we helped other tribes pass some as well. Uh, I work with um, Climate Reality Project. I do trainings. I think that's an incredible group, a lot of young people involved, but they're not gonna accomplish it all either. I work with lots of groups. I was there at Standing Rock. I understand the social justice part and completely agree with that. Climate justice, climate change is the elephant in the middle of the room. But it's not there in a vacuum. We need social justice. If you stood at Standing Rock, if you stand near any of the reservations of our native brothers and sisters, you'll see that fossil fuel has been just as hard on them as renewables may be. The problem in the short term is we have to get off fossil fuel. It may not be perfect. Maybe things will have to change. 
But for now, whatever we have, solar, wind, hydro, we've got to use what we have to get over the hump or it'll be too late. We won't be worrying about it. I worry about my grandkids. I worry about somebody mentioned the seven generations. I've been a storyteller for years and years. And yes, storytellers are popping up all over now. I'm thrilled to see it. Um, the seven generations is something we were trained to care about, to think about, to do nothing unless we considered the seven generations first and make sure it didn't have a negative impact. We gave that up long ago. Most people, not all people. We have to do it again. Although now the urgency is such that we can't just worry about seven generations. We got to worry about the next generation. In fact, we have to worry about our generation. It's in front of us now. The person that had all the temperature changes, and I'm sorry, I can't remember all the names. I wish I could. Absolutely correct. And we can still do this. This is a positive thing, not a negative, but we've got to continue to stand up and do it. For me, I see the young people and I stand there with the young people and anything I can do to support, I do. When I see people like Brianna, who was on in the beginning, that's awesome. That's what we need to see. When I see Greta Thunberg stand up and speak, this little girl who stood for weeks, for months, in front of her government buildings in her country, I say, we can still do this. It's, it's a multi-pronged thing in my world. For me, it's action, prayer, education, and ceremony, apex. I've been talking about this for a long time, but now people are listening. We have to combine these things. We have to tap into the young people and their energy. We have to tap into our indigenous brothers and sisters because they still have the teachings. They've been much closer to the earth than we have. And I have indigenous blood. I'm, I'm Native American and I'm in, uh, Romani Gypsy, but I didn't live right on the land like some of my relatives have. So we need those teachings. We need to bring them forward. We need to combine these all together. One thing we're doing now that Helen said is the sacred places, sacred sites, because we realize around the globe, every culture has sacred places. Every people has sacred places and sacred sites. It's a great way to pull people together because jointly we can look at these. And so next month when the Unity, um, Unity Week is coming on, we're gonna have people from around the globe telling their stories about the sacred places. They're all under risk too. Many are being attacked. Uh, India, Africa, Great Britain, Stonehenge is under attack. My brothers and sisters down in the Southwest. We can't afford to do that either because as elders tell us and have told us for a long, long time, if we lose those sacred sites, we lose our spirit. We can't afford to lose our spirit now. The energy we're sharing tonight we have to share down with the young people. Yes, we have to make sure we share what's going on and how dangerous it is, but then we have to shift into, we can do this, we are doing this. <clears throat> and so I will continue to do that as long as I have breath. And I know there's a lot of other elders doing that as well. Working now across generations, pulling together panels and Sue is great at this. I don't even remember how we met, Sue, but suddenly we're working with uh, elders and young people. Exactly what I see is one way forward. And so working with people of other cultures, stop seeing white, red, black, or yellow. Stop seeing male or female. Stop seeing young or old. See people. See the brothers and sisters we have to finish this with. We've started. Now we have to finish. We started years ago. Some of, some of you were around in the 70s, I know it, 60s. And we started, but we didn't finish. We had no one to support us. We were hung out there. We were told to sit down, shut up and be quiet. It's not the case anymore. We need to be there for those who are now standing up and speaking. So for me, that's the way forward. Keep up all our good works, but unite, unite, unite in any way we can. Thank you. Matakriasi. Thank you, Jim. It was wonderful. And um, 
I do appreciate that uh, we cannot lose our spirit. That um, I think what we're what we're looking for is spiritual solutions to these very physical problems that our our balance of nature has been upset, and we are um, coming together as a human family and uh, learning how to do this. So thank you, Jim. And I'd like to introduce my friend Ensign Cowell. Um, I met Ensign through the Florida Interfaith Climate Actions Network and uh, was just so impressed with the work that he's doing um, through a, uh, well, I guess we met through the um, Spirituality and Sustainability Conference. Or I didn't go, but he and a number of people uh, that we both know were part of that, uh, where he learned about the uh, Earth Charter and the Pope's encyclical. And so tapping into that um, spiritual side of things has been really important to me. And I love the way that um, Ensign and his friends in Southwest Florida are putting that into action. So Ensign, could you tell us a little about your climate story? Sure enough. Um, I really um, came into uh, the whole climate thing through an environmental um, lens, if you will, or vector. I heard David Suzuki, a Vancouver-based naturalist, uh, give a acceptance talk in Cleveland, which is our home, and uh, I'm in Fort Myers. I'm actually a resident of Florida now. Um, <clears throat> and he said, we have uh, over 7 billion, now approaching 8 billion mammals that are so impacting the earth that we're on a collision course to uh, terrible uh, problems. And um, he held up a letter from the Union of Concerned Scientists of 20 years earlier that said that if we continued current trends, we'd be in trouble. And part of that manifestation, of course, is uh, we've had so much impact that we're impacting our climate, our ecosystems to such an extent. And uh, so anyway, through uh, um, connections at the Florida Interfaith Climate Action Network, I got invited to go to Assisi, which was in the tradition of Thomas Berry, if you all know him, a geologian, theologian. Um, and uh, we met with uh, Cardinal Turkson, who was the Pope's guy on the Laudato Sea Initiative. And um, eventually we formed a nonprofit called Spirituality Study of a Global Network, uh, where we're trying to bring together people who have uh, been involved in this whole area of eco spirituality and try to foster a network as supportive of especially young eco spiritual leaders. Um, through the Interfaith Climate Action Network and me being so galvanized by David Suzuki, um, I got in conversation with people down here in this area, Southwest Florida, which we think of as a five county bioregion. And we had a luncheon, kind of a serendipitous luncheon of five of us on Martin Luther King Day uh, three years ago. And uh, we started meeting regularly and discussing how could we be active? How could we make impact? And uh, there were some just tremendous people. One, the founder of the Beckman Institute, the University of Illinois, uh, Fred Moon, who ran the Cerdner Foundation, a billion dollar foundation in New York, tremendous people, tremendous background. And we decided to form a, an entity, another nonprofit called uh, Reset. Um, which stands for Restorative Ecological Social and Economic Transformation, which has a vision of the what's needed to be a stable, sustainable, peaceful, spiritually fulfilling human presence on the earth as the Pachamama Alliance people's uh, mantra. We need a great transformation. And so we thought this, if we could form an organization that could collaborate and bring together various people on key initiatives that that would help advance the whole cause towards the great transformation. And the three initiative areas that we've been working on initially, and we have a website, um, uh, are rights of nature. And the big news statewide is that we're trying to be part of a five part 
state constitutional amendments that would guarantee people clean water and all kinds of stuff like that. Fabulous initiative. Rates of nature is a way to embody that nature. And that means us citizens have a right to a sustainable environment. Uh, the second initiative is on regenerative agriculture, uh, both in local community gardens, uh, local agriculture, and of course, big ag. And uh, Florida's a, a big agricultural state, as is Ohio. And uh, we need to, our soils have been depleted. They've been, I was just getting something on my thing while this meeting was starting about how pesticides destroy the, all the things in the soil. You end up a, a, a handful of soil which has had pesticides, it's been deteriorated. So the whole uh, uh, amount of carbon capture, restoration of biodiversity, um, regenerative agriculture is, is a tremendous thing. And in that there's a whole uh, uh, civil uh, uh, justice, uh, social justice aspect of farmers and farm workers mm -hmm. who are tragically underpaid and disadvantaged and so forth. And, uh, and uh, the whole big ag corporate machine is, is terrible. So anyway, regenerative ag. And the third is resilience ecology. And resilience ecology, and I'm a finance guy, not a, not a uh, soil scientist or anything of the kind, uh, is all about that we have to respect natural systems, meaning our water systems, our air systems, so forth. And we have to understand that we're part of nature and we've imposed on nature as though it's something we just take and consume instead of respecting that we have to. And you, you know, there's a book by E.O. Wilson called Half Earth that suggests that if we don't leave half of the earth to let those natural systems, like we talk about the Amazon, the lungs of the planet, you know, of the, the, you know and, and, and most people that are at all uh, into this understand this, but are we active, are we getting out? So ultimately in all our efforts, I think as all of you have spoken so eloquently and so inspiringly, is to activate more people and get them into the story and, and get them with the kind of passion and, and proactive involvement that you all demonstrate. And uh, it, it's been a, a, great, a great night to hear you about it all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ensign. Wonderful. And thank you for all the work you do down in Southwest Florida. Um, I'm going to uh, just tell you a little bit about my climate story because I feel like I was interested in this ever since I saw the earth from space back in 1968. It just hit me that we are so small in this universe. And this is such a precious planet that we live on that we really have to take care of it. So the idea um, that we are one human family and one earth community with a common destiny uh, really appealed to me when I read that in the earth charter. And for 20 years now, I've been using the earth charter to uh, kind of unify my own approach to educating for a culture of peace. So I mentioned earlier that we each have a story to tell at this critical moment in Earth's history. And I want to make it a really good one for my grandchildren and their grandchildren. And I feel like we're all on the road to 2030 and beyond. And I wanna tell you a little bit about that because we are um, in my children's story that we're kind of piecing together with all of these climate stories we've heard tonight. Uh, the children are going to help uh, win all of the sustainable development goals that were put out in by the United Nations in the year 2015 to uh, accomplish by the year 2030. So uh, we're calling this the road to 2030 and beyond because we will, I believe, win those global goals. And not only that, but we're going to go farther and reverse global warming and have peace on earth. Why not? If we're going to tell a good story, let's make it a really good one. So um, what we're doing then is uh, telling stories, playing games, and I want to uh, hear uh, from our dear friend, 
Angelique, who will uh, also known as Born in a Cloud of Smoke, who will kind of summarize what we're doing here. And now you can understand who uh, uh, Born in a Cloud is because she's kind of the voice of the elders that have, uh, we have wisdom from the ages that we've been collecting for thousands of years. And we now have an opportunity to share that with young people. And so I wonder if you could come in and give us a little bit of what you've gleaned from our climate stories tonight. Born in a cloud of smoke. Oh, gee, be glad so. Thank you. Thank everyone for their climate stories. Oh, so inspiring. So I was thinking about everything that you said in your stories and about how we, all of this is connected. I was trying very hard to put one story in one pillar and another story. No, it didn't work very well for me because they all fit everywhere. Everything is connected, even in what you said. But some things I heard, we take care of what we care about. We take care of what we care about. And we care about that with which we're in relationship to. All about that relationship. So each one of you in your stories, you talked about a relationship, a relationship to your own personal experience, or your relationship you got into with someone else that led you to a different thought and a different way of doing things. So the other thing I heard was this thing about the law, the natural law. We're taught natural law supersedes all other, all other law. And it is our teacher as well. So unlike many of you, I actually always knew that I was part of this environment and it was part of me. I can't imagine thinking anything else. And I live in the woods with these trees and with these waters. To this day, I go to that water every day and I thank that water. So I know what it's like to have that relationship. But I met people along the way that didn't have that. Never climbed a tree. Never put their feet in the mud. Never felt the rain on their face. And I think, how could they care about these things if they never had a relationship? So when I hear all these stories, the thing that we're doing now is we're collecting stories. So we heard your stories, but we want people to get more stories so that we can tell that story that Sue was talking about, how we changed the world, how we made it different, how we brought things down, because it's important to tell those stories. We learn from them. We learn from the stories from before and we can learn from the stories that we're creating today. So I think they're gonna talk a little bit about how you, each one of you here can get another person to tell their story. And those that are listening out there, we have a little challenge between now and June, eh, Sue, right, June? We want to make sure that we have seven stories at least. That's not too many. It could be more, but at least seven stories that we can kind of put in those pillars. And then we'll be able to share it out. And we have lots of ways that you can contribute your story. And Sue, I'll talk about that a little bit too. Well, my granddaughter, Brianna, she started us out with a game. I'm wondering how we're doing on that game. Did I win, Brianna? Yeah. 
a darn mute button got me to um it's not quite a game that we can win but it is a game that we can win if we all play together and when you know when we all come together and win the big world game this game that we're talking about here uh the earth charter treasure hunt is a game where we're not necessarily fighting against each other but with each other and we're gonna go on this hunt and we're gonna search for these people alongside one another um and with these stories that we have here collected today i'm kind of in that same situation that you were in where it's really hard for me to categorize them into certain pillars and into, you know, certain categories um, based on what the content of the story is, because everyone's climate story kind of falls into each of them. Um, you know, there might be stronger themes in one story as opposed to another, but they all fall into each and every category. And we're all, you know, we all have the same goals. We all want the same things. And that's what we're doing here and with our Earth Charter Treasure Hunt is we're, we're bringing all of that into one space where we can, you know, when we're, out, when we're united, we're stronger. We're a lot stronger. She's so smart, don't you think? Oh, I just love her. <laughs> I love her too. <laughs> I've really enjoyed meeting your, your dear friend and grand, Shannon's granddaughter. Maybe Shannon could just say hello, your your friend Shannon. Is she there? I'm here. <laughs> I'm here too. Hi, hi everybody. <laughs> this is the grandmother of our friend Brianna, and uh, they've both been so wonderful to work with. So, I want to um, just close this with uh, asking Brianna. Oh, first I wanted to say that um, we are playing these Earth Clash games in order to win the uh, world game that Buckminster Fuller started back in the 1960s. And we're, our goal is to make the world work for 100% of humanity and the community of life on Earth. And so that's the game we're playing. We're using the uh, Eco Challenge. We're using the Earth Clash Treasure Hunt. We're going to be inventing a lot of games to play as we go on down the road to 2030. And Brianna, could you just explain a little about the um, Earth Flash Printernet Gazette that we've been working on? Absolutely. So the Earth Flash Printernet Gazette, as it is right now, it's kind of a informational, um, I would call it a small magazine um, that kind of gives a, a summary of what we are doing and what we are factoring into our project. and what we're incorporating in our project and how we are taking what we're doing and how we're gonna bring it further with um, children's groups, with youth groups and even adults and elders. Um, and so it's one of our places alongside the blog for um, Gardens of Global Unity. It's one of our places where we have everything there where you can find all the links, you can find all the information, you can find all of the summaries, you can find bios about us who wrote it. Um, and that's what we're going to build off of with our future editions where we add in our games and we add in um, things that people have been doing that we are seeing different panels, different activities, games, groups, all that stuff. So. So it's, a, it's been a, a dream these kids have been helping. We have Adrian, uh, who's a 13-year-old uh, um, wonderful activist who has a YouTube channel and his two sisters uh, who have been helping to uh, get this storytelling adventure started. And um, what we're doing then is, is inviting the young people to uh, work on these games and stories as we go through the year. And coming up in June, we have the Earth Charter anniversary. We want to invite the children to help us uh, categorize these stories uh, so that we can announce them uh, at the Welcome to We Show next month. And then in September, we're going to go through the 11 days of global unity, which is uh, we the world's way of, of 
uh, finding spiritual solutions to all of the uh, environmental and social challenges of our time. And uh, Rick, I'm sure will be able to tell us a little bit about that, but uh, we will be focusing on unity, uh, interdependence, peace, and a few other things. So it's um, just really exciting to be working with all of these wonderful people. And uh, Rick, I think that uh, I want to say to you, thank you for letting us uh, work with you and the Welcome to We show as it's developed over the, uh, over the years. We've been working on this almost three years now. Did you realize that? Anyway. That's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I thank you. And uh, I just, great thanks to every single one of you here tonight for sharing your climate stories and for being part of our Florida Earth Charter Initiative, whether you live in, um, it's actually the Florida Climate Conversation to Action Program. Whether you live in Florida or not, we have a global network of support and it's just a joy. So thank you. Wow. Wow, this has been just an extraordinary combination of stories. And um, I learned so much. I'm sure many people le learned quite a bit. And um, is there anything anyone wants to say before we finish up? I have some announcements I'd like to make, but, but is there anything else about the program or any invitations that you want to make to to folks to get involved. So, um, so I just want to whoever is watching out there in the in the uh, review or current view of this um, to to just uh, find ways to tell your story and uh, definitely uh, get a hold of Sue, get a hold of We the World, and uh, those are some avenues you can find for places to put your story. So um, we look forward to the next time. And I want to say congratulations to this group of climate collaborators that got together and did such great work and continue to educate the rest of us as we continue on. And um, thanks for letting me be a, a witness and a part of the joy of that. Thank you, Shannon, and, and a special thanks to Born in a Cloud of Smoke. <laughs> and Rick, I would like to add that uh, people can go to the climatecollaboratory.org and we will have the link uh, for the welcome to, uh, for the Earth Flash Printernet Gazette and learn more about how you can be involved in the collaborative storytelling adventure. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, so I do have um, a few announcements. Um, next month, which is June, we will uh, have the, the next Welcome to We show. I think Sue mentioned that a little bit. Um, it'll be on June 15th. It's always the third Tuesday of each month. Um, and many things are happening in June. Um, June is International Children's Month. Uh, Heidi Little is taking the lead on that. Um, and so there's, there can be celebrations all month long uh, regarding children and youth um, for our um, campaign for children and youth. And, um, and also World Unity Week which uh, someone also mentioned during our talk earlier. Um, World Unity Week is June 19th through the 26th. We the World is one of the co-convening organizations. Uh, the primary uh, sponsor and host of World Unity Week is Unity Earth. And uh, we have all kinds of things happening there. Um, in June, uh, it'll also be the three month countdown to 11 days of global unity, which as Sue mentioned, 
uh, is an annual kind of convergence of events that goes from September 11th through September 21st, which is the International Day of Peace. So uh, lots of preparation for that and um, many, uh, we, we hope to collaborate with even more partners uh, for that going forward. Um, I also want to mention that our next issue of Trends Magazine will be released in June. Um, the full title is Trends in Global Grassroots Organizing. And it's our online magazine featuring the change agents and movements creating peace, justice, sustainability, and transformation around the planet. And you can find out more and download the latest issue by going to trends.we.net. And of course, to learn more about all of the things that We the World and the We Campaign, all the things that we're doing, please go to we.net. So I just want to thank everyone. And um, we have our usual way of um, ending, which is to uh, talk about that it's all about we, right? Our dear friend Jonathan Granoff at the launch of the We campaign and we.net, he said, I hope that we expands so much that there is no longer any them. So thank you. It's all about we. Thank you and bye-bye.